Well, I have to say, a causality is the most challenging piece of this, I think, for most of us. Because we grow up in a very cause and effect, scientific, empirical worldview, in which if something happens, the importance of it is seen by many of us as related to what caused that to happen. So, you know, sometimes our lives depend on that. If we get cancer, <laughs> we want to look at what caused the cancer, right? Cause and effect, empirical research, you know, Western science essentially, is really important. Jung wanted to establish a principle that was as important as that principle of cause and effect, except ensconce it within our subjective psyche so that events would be connected through the subjective meaning rather than what caused them or what their effects were. That's really hard for people to get their head around. So I always tell a story that sort of I entitle, I was a synchronicity virgin before this happened. It was my first synchronicity. So, <laughs> um, and Adam, this is it's sort of funny to see you here, right? Because Adam and I know one another from way back. So I did my internship at Unitas. It was this a campus ministry organization run by the Methodists and Presbyterians. And it was right across the street from UC Berkeley. <clears throat> and UC Berkeley Counseling Center at the time had a complete overflow of clients. They couldn't see all the clients. So they contacted all the campus ministries and said, do you have anyone that's trained in pastoral care or pastoral counseling that you could see that would take the overflow? And so I was enrolled uh, in a degree in theology, and I was going to get my marriage and family therapy license, and there were a couple of other others. So we were sort of did like, oh, let's create a counseling center, like, you know, the Judy Garland movie, like, oh, let's create, we'll get a self-supervisor, well, we'll, do, we'll be counselors, right? So that's what happened. We actually hired a supervisor, and the three of us put together a counseling center under the nonprofit umbrella of this, um, you know, uh, under the nonprofit umbrella of this Methodist and Presbyterian campus ministry. And of course, we were all in seminary at the time, so we're all like, you know, good Christians, and we're like, we're not gonna be those like profit making therapists who are charging clients lots of money. We're gonna give away counseling. We're gonna no fee, no limit counseling, right? which means that every like borderline and psychotic client in the entire Bay Area came to see us because they had been thrown out of everywhere else. And it was crazy. So we, our supervisor, it was, we were way over our heads. We were way, way, way over our heads. Anyway, we hired a really wonderful supervisor who, uh, Yuan Ying, who was very Freudian, very psychoanalytic, very, structure, transference, everything happened in the transference, you know. But this is exactly what we needed, so that's what happened. So I'm seeing her as a supervisor, I get this client, I was what, 23, maybe? <laughs> and I'm seeing clients your age, <laughs> right, who've been thrown out of other counseling centers because they're too difficult. So I had this guy who's been through seven different therapists, and you know, naive me, um, he's living with his mom, he has these big mom issues, and he's, you know, feels a little, it's a little bit like Norman Bates, actually, kind of a little bit like... <laughs> living with mom, you know, hostile dependency on his mother, essentially. Can't stand her, but can't live without her, et cetera. He's acting out sexually, which was the proximate reason he came in, the presenting problem. And so in the course of, you know, we establish enough of an empathic connection. I mean, it is a little strange. He's like the age of my dad. <laughs> but, and so we end up eventually talking about, one day we end up eventually talking about power. So it was actually one of those days like this past winter, right? Huge Bay Area storm, right? And we had these tiny little rooms in the, um, in fact, <laughs> we had these tiny little rooms in the Unitas. In fact, the, the place has since been remodeled, and the place where I used to do my counseling is now the men's room. <laughs> I've been back there. Like, you go back there, you're like, okay, oh, it's now the men's room, okay. Still processing shit here. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sitting in the room, we're talking, and he's coming in, and he's talking about how his mother's controlling and dominating behavior is making him feel really powerless. And so I'm just being Mr. Empathic. This is like first or second year of my like counseling. You know, I'm just like giving 
non-conditional positive regard or whatever we were taught to do then. And I'm like, oh, you're feeling really powerless. I feel really powerless. So he's describing all the various ways his mother manipulates him and controls him. And I'm like, yeah, I can see how powerless you feel. He says, yeah, I'm just powerless. I'm powerless to do anything about this. And all the lights went out. <laughs> right. So I'm sitting there like, woo. All right, that's kind of crazy. Like totally powerless. We have a power failure. Like we have a literal power failure. We have a subjective power failure. He doesn't notice it. He's just in his like, you know, you know how you get in therapy sometimes, you know, you're like in your space. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> so it sort of calms him down. I'm, we continue with the session kind of in the half dark, <laughs> you know, it's a story. There's a window. So there's some light. It's not like we're sitting in the dark, some light. We're going on, you know, I'm just saying like finally kind of making a bit of a connection with this guy. And I said, yeah, I can really understand that. You know, she's doing this, she's doing that, she's doing this, she's doing that. And, you know, it must really feel difficult. I said, but I think, you know, I would suggest humbly that you actually, you know, given your age, that you actually have more power in the situation than you, than you think sometimes, that there are ways that you're cooperating with this. Let's look at some of the ways in which you're cooperating with this unconsciously, subconsciously. So, but the idea that he might have some power in response to his mother is sort of a bit of an insight. Like, oh. So he says, so you're saying I'm powerful. And I said, well, I don't know about powerful, but you certainly definitely have some power, more power in the situation than I think you do at times. And I, our work would be about, let's look at the various ways in which you could assert some of that power. So he says, so you're saying I'm powerful? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I think you could be powerful. And he goes, powerful, powerful. And all the lights go back on. <laughs> it was so weird, right? So what happens is, here we go. There we go. The power came on synchronistically. All right. The power came on synchronistically. So I'm like, that was weird. I go to my supervisor, my Freudian supervisor, and she quite contemptuously said, that's one of those things those Jungians call synchronistic. <laughs> I swear to God, that's what she said. Right. And she worked at Langley Porter. And you know, I mean, we're of an age when, remember when, I mean, Jung was just a crackpot. I mean, that's partly why there even is an APC, right? This is like, that was just, you know, Jungian ideas before Joseph Campbell in the mid 80s. None of that, you know, we were all those crackpots. So that's kind of where she came out of. She was just like, oh, that was synchronous. And I had never even heard the term before. So that started me on my little synchronicity career. But I like telling that story because that story has all the elements that I want to illustrate, which is to say that um, the a causality of it is important to understand. What Jung means by that is not non-causal, because obviously the power outage has a cause. You know, the generator in Richmond was a squirrel ate through the line and the power went off in Berkeley, you know. There's an actual cause to the power outage. What Jung means by a causal is that the, the actual proximate cause of the event doesn't matter as much as what the internal meaning or impact of the event is. So it's an a-causal connecting principle. The connection doesn't matter. The cause of the connection doesn't matter. It's a-causal. So there's a cause, but it's just a-causal. So that, the a-causality of it, I think, is really kind of important to understand. It's right, right in the title of the book. It's the most important thing. That's what he means by that. So what will often occur, and it's kind of hard not to do this, like given the example and some of the other things I'll talk about, I mean, what people will often do in an event like that, especially in Berkeley, they'll, you know, like, well, you know, his psychic energy was so big and the vibrations were such that they, like, disturbed the electrical field and the boom, 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 boom. And Jung is like, well, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. That's not the point. The point is, it impacted me emotionally which is the second aspect of a synchronistic event, and which distinguishes it a synchronistic event from like an ordinary coincidence. And that is that it has an emotional impact. It's significant. <laughs> you know, the connecting principle equals, it was meaningful. So you and I have coincidences that occur to us every day. You know, I'm like doing a crossword puzzle, and 
you know, seven letter clue, singer from Hoboken and a Frank Sinatra song comes on and like that's the answer. I'm like, oh, Sinatra, that was great, thank you. Right, but that wasn't especially meaningful. Or people will come up to me and tell me, you know, like, oh, this incredible thing happened to me. My cat was like walking across the back of the couch, and I thought she might fall off, and she did. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> Not to say that isn't meaningful, but but that's what I'm saying. Like that story I told you about my client, like. There's a particular aspect of synchronistic events that occur within a particular moment of emotional ripeness. And there are often these turning points in our lives, either internal lives or external lives or both. And that's what a synchronistic event. So the second aspect of it is that a synchronistic event has to be emotionally significant. There has to be a kind of significance, right? And that's what, you know, what is, what is meaning? You know, was ist Bedeutung? I don't know, what is meaning? meaning you know, I sort of, I'm a clinician, so I define it somewhat practically rather than philosophically. And for the purposes of the books, meaningful means it has an impact on me, subjectively, or I can point to the way in which this particular coincidence changed my life. It actually eventuated in a significant change. And that's what's really inspiring, I'll say, to some extent about the books, and certainly the books sit on the inspiration I get from my actual work because people come into psychotherapy to change. So it's nice to see those changes. And what happens at various points is that sometimes those changes occur due to synchronistic events that the clients themselves or I myself didn't even attempt to organize or implement. So something like this, you know. Where, so this incident that I just talked to you about from my early internship is a great illustration because if a synchronistic event is primarily due to one's the subjective meaning of the event to the person, what that means is the same thing can occur to two people, and for one person it'll be synchronistic, and for the other person it won't. The meaning of the event is not outside in the event, it's inside in our experience of it. So it was synchronistic for me, but my client didn't even know the lights were off. <laughs> It didn't even occur to him. It didn't occur to him mentally. It didn't even occur to him experientially. He didn't even realize, he didn't even realize the lights were off. Or the microphone was off. So, so that's, I think, kind of important, too. And that gets to some of the issues I'm sure we in this room have all faced when we're not in analysis and not talking to someone who's interested in our internal experience and attuned and empathic, but we're trying to tell a friend about something that occurred to us and we're really excited about it and they're like, tilt, like <laughs> dunk it. <laughs> uh, I, incur I uh, actually, that happened to me in writing the first book because I think there's a sort of little like meaning fatigue that eventually occurred to my editor as she was reading through it. So toward the end of the book, you know, there, was, there were a lot of incidents, particularly in the chapters on birth and death, and she kept saying, like, so what? Who cares? Why? And I'm like, well, if you're not interested in what the person's internal experience of it is, then you're not going to understand why it was synchronistic. <laughs> like, you have to be able to empathize with what the person's actually experienced and be willing to get into the person's internal world because the meaning of the event is not outside. Sometimes the coincidences are dramatic. You know, like that's a particularly dramatic one, and I'll talk about some other dramatic ones. And people can usually get behind the drama, you know, the improbability of some of these coincidences that occur. But a lot of times the meaning is very sort of internal. And if you're not interested in the person's inner life, then, you know, you're going to encounter, you're going to have an amazing coincidence that occurred to you, and you're going to want to tell somebody about it. And they may not necessarily be all that responsive to it. So that's just to say, again, in keeping with synchronicity as a psychological principle. The subjectivity of it is inherent in the experience and in the concept as you intended it. So the third aspect is also illustrated by this, and this is what I, Jung didn't talk about this as much in his work on synchronicity, but of course his entire ugh, was pervaded by this, and that is that synchronistic events always have a symbolic quality to them. There's always a particular symbol that seems to be the focus of it. And that's what I found, that's what I find really the most interesting, you know, about some of it, especially when I'm working with a client 
who's dealing with a synchronistic event, I'm always like, okay, where's the symbol? What's the symbolic quality of this? You know, like in this instance, the lights going on or off, the power failure, you know, the literal power failure, signified was a symbol for the internal state of the client, and in this case, the unconscious internal state of the client. Like the client himself wasn't even all that conscious of the external power failure. So there's always a symbolic quality to that. So we sometimes encounter, you know, I sometimes I encounter that because some synchronistic events have to do with sort of a run of symbols in people's lives. So I'll get folks after talks like this come up and say, well, I've been seeing swans everywhere. What do swans mean? And I'm like, I don't know what's, <laughs> what do they mean to you? I, don't, I hate to be Jesuitical about this, but like, what do they mean to you? You know, like, that's the point. The point is that what, the, what, is, what that shows is somewhat of an incipient awareness that there's a symbolic quality to this run of symbols they're encountering. So when, when, you know, when I'm working with a client or talking with a friend or even working with a synchronistic event myself in which I'm seeing a particular sign, symbol, particular situation that continues to recur, that's generally a sign that something's going on symbolically in the unconscious that I need to look at, that that symbol has become meaningful in some way. And the fourth incident, the fourth aspect of it uh, that I talk about is a little bit my personal contribution to this. Uh, Jung didn't talk about this as much. Subsequent Jungians talked about it a bit more. Uh, Murray Stein, back in Chicago, back in the 80s, published a uh, uh, a volume on Chiron called uh, Liminality and Borderline Phenomena, and in which he's looking at the way in which times of transition for us are rich times of synchronicity. So synchronicity, sort of to flip that around, synchronicity often occurs in times of transition, and a lot of times what, what happens is we're not, even, we're not even aware of the transition that we're in, until we're made aware of it by a synchronistic event. So one of the stories that I tell is an old friend of mine from Georgetown, who I knew in Georgetown, he moved out to San Francisco. While we were at Georgetown, this woman arrived for our last year from Brazil, and she was in a way kind of his erotic ideal, you know, a complete incarnation of his anima. She was exotic, she was dark, she was passionate, she was highly sexual, she was a lot of fun. He had a huge crush on her, as did a lot of the other guys at Georgetown. And so he really didn't make much headway with her, but when he came out to San Francisco and we became reacquainted, he would constantly talk about her. Well, in the interim, he married, he met and married, a, you know, a regular woman that he loved, He's still married to actually, and kids. And, um, but at the time, you know, there was this erotic ideal of this woman that had gotten away, the one who had gotten away in Georgetown. So lo and behold, suddenly I get a call from him, and it turns out her name is Beja. Turns out he's at a sports bar with somebody downtown, and who shows up but Beja? Suddenly she's in San Francisco. And he's like, oh my God, what an amazing coincidence this is. This is really meaningful. Here's this woman that I've had this erotic crush on a long time. He's sort of married to this normal woman. It's not that exciting. He's wondering whether he did the right thing. And suddenly, the woman of his dreams shows up in the bar next to him. She's like, oh my god, that's it. That is the synchronistic event of my life. So, you know, she recognizes him from Georgetown. They develop a bit of a friendship. Of course, he's like thinking it's going to go somewhere. Well, it was synchronistic, but not in the way that he <laughs> intended it to be. As he got to know her, he got to see kind of how narcissistic and borderline she was. She was really kind of nutty. She was really kind of crazy. And she was using him kind of to debrief all of her strange erotic adventures with all these other guys, which is definitely not what he wanted the relationship to become. <laughs> and so eventually what occurred was sort of this odd flip in which suddenly he began to see her not just as his projected fantasy, but get to know the whole crazy mess that happened to be Beja. So finally he's talking to me, he's like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to continue to get together with her. This is just a little bit kind of weird and unhealthy. This, 
chick really needs to like. So he goes to call her up and he doesn't get any response. Like the phone rings, it's not even answering. So he goes to her apartment, knocks on the door, no one answers. He goes to the apartment manager and the apartment manager is like, she's gone. She like left two days ago. We have no idea where she is. She just left. No forwarding address. He's never seen her since. So he made this kind of internal shift about the relationship and suddenly she came into his life and she left his life like that. And again, that's another one of those pieces where I think what the transition was, was he needed to accept his actual life that he was really living in, you know, with a normal person, <laughs> with a normal woman in a normal relationship that actually had a future, not some psychiatrically disturbed crazy lady that he used to know once back a time in college. But when those synchronistic events occur to you, they kind of overwhelm you, you know, you're sort of like, Oh my God, this is crazy. I met this, you know. And nowadays, I think with the internet and particularly Facebook, you know, like all of these synchronistic events kind of occur, like people you may know, you know. That's what's been happening with you. You keep popping up and saying, people you may know, you know. Because uh, Vicky Joe and John just posted pictures from Poland. And suddenly like everyone on John's list and Vicky Joe's list keeps popping up. I'm like, oh, I haven't talked to Adam in a really long time. And I show up and here's Adam. I'm like, okay. So, that's what happens. What happens eventually is like the long time connections pop up. Whether they're meaningful or not, what transitions they betoken in our lives is something that actually Jung felt, I feel, we feel, we need to work with. Just because the event occurred, like in the situation with Beja, just because he happened to bump into her, doesn't necessarily mean they were fated to be together, and now it is possible. Something else may actually be underneath it. So transitions, that's one of those things that I think, if you have a synchronistic event that occurs to you, uh, it's important to kind of look for the transition that it might betoken. Now, sometimes synchronistic events occur in times of overt intended transition. Uh, you know, we're changing jobs, certain kinds of connections occur. Uh, the ones that I think are kind of the more delightful ones are the ones in, the ones in which uh, the transition isn't something we even believe, you know, we're not even aware of that we need to. Uh, so a lot of times what occurs uh, in a synchronistic event is the worst thing that occurs to us is actually the best thing that <laughs> occurred to us. So like a particular kind of aspect of this and is that uh, a friend of mine was running a business and needed to hire employees to do a specific job and she found what was supposed to be the perfect employee. So that was that and she was all ready to go and the day before this woman was supposed to start, this woman kind of had an accident and my, my, um, my friend was just completely overwhelmed by that. Like, oh my God, you know, this is the day before she's supposed to start, this has to get done, what's gonna happen? And it turns out that the substitute she got for the woman that she was going to hire was actually much better qualified. So it's one of those incidents in which this particular synchronistic event isn't necessarily the most wonderful thing that occurs to you. Sometimes it's something that's really kind of unfortunate. It's like the thing we don't want to have happen is the thing that's synchronistic. So I wanna sort of make sure that people understand that synchronistic events aren't always what our ego necessarily wants. And that's where we get to the more Jungian underlayment of this, which is to say that the archetype that's at the base of a synchronistic event is the self. In other words, what's happening is our capacity to make meaning derives in Jungian terms from the archetypal action of the self in our life. Now, of course, we're up here in our ego a lot of times, we run on our everyday lives, and these synchronistic events stop us in our tracks and they bring our fuller, more whole self to our consciousness. Sometimes through a shocking, negative, or even disastrous kind of circumstance, coincidence. And sometimes through sort of a coincidence like I've been talking about, you know, things that are sort of immediately experienced as delightful, amazing, impactful, sort of spontaneously. And that's where I think I'll say this too, I can say this kind of to a Jungian group. That's why it sort of feels like it's out there and not in here. You know, the self is big. 
it's, you know, it's not something that we can walk around with a continuous consciousness of in, as in the action of in our lives. You know, we sort of reside in our ego, and we need to reside in our ego to get through life, right? So the synchronistic event, the meaningfulness of it, our capacity to experience meaning comes from the self. And that's why it sort of feels like it's beyond us. So a lot of times what happens is that, you know, I tell these stories. So in the first book, I looked at synchronicity and love, synchronicity in people's work lives, synchronicity in people's spiritual lives, synchronicity in their dream lives, and then synchronicity in the two transitions that we all make, which is birth and death. And that's what um, I found kind of fascinating, sort of track those things. In the category of spiritual, what happens is that a lot of times people who have a spiritual or religious faith will attribute the synchronistic event to God. God sent this person into my life. This was part of God's plan for my life. However, one might understand God, right? And, you know, as you all know, uh, Jung would not gainsay that. So I'd like to actually support that. But Jung is looking at it psychologically and not theologically. And I often say, too, that, you know, you can insert whatever meaning you want to put to the synchronistic event. And if it happens to fit into your faith tradition, and that's the meaning you're experiencing of it. I can't say that God did or didn't. Really, frankly, neither can you. But if that's your sense of the synchronistic event, then a religious or spiritual meaning of it is just as valid as any other kind of meaning of it. So the meaning of it really depends on who you are and what the larger aspect of it. But when people say that, I know that the archetype of the self is active because the archetype of the self is sort of the God image and the human psyche. You know, We feel touched by something beyond us when synchronistic events occur. So uh, when I wrote the first book, you know, I had all the various topics going on there. And some of them, you know, were quite powerful. But I had a lot of, con I had a lot of people tell me stories about synchronistic events in the relationships with their families. And I didn't really have very much, I didn't really plan for that in the first book. So the second book is Synchronicity and the Stories of Our Families. And I have a, quite a few stories of my own that those stories kind of brought up for me. So the one that I like to tell is the story of my, my birth mother. So I was adopted by the Hopkins, adopted at birth. And for a long time, I didn't really have that much interest in my birth parents. I mean, the Hopkins were normal, healthy family, had a wonderful upbringing in New Jersey you know, wanted for nothing. I was, it was good. I didn't really have any desire to meet my birth parents. And I started my analysis with Ray Kilduff in, in Berkeley, and I started having dreams about my birth parents. Italian mothers, Italian fathers. I was like, okay. And you know, as analysts do, they like poke at us. And I'm like, I think there are un unresolved issues going on here unconscious. I'm like, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good. And like, you keep having dreams about your birth parents. So what's interesting about that, of course, is that I grew up with the Hopkins, but a long relationship to Italy, a long relationship. So started taking French when I was in eighth grade, went to France when I was for a summer, came back speaking French fluently at, you know, in ninth grade. So I just started to take Italian, picked that up really quickly. Living in New Jersey, there was nothing but Italian and Jews. So hung out with all the Italians that were in the Italian class with me. Sort of became kind of an adoptive son of a lot of these Italian families. Back when I had big, dark, curly hair and this beard, I looked Italian. People often thought I was Italian. Go to Georgetown. I'm a French-Italian major at Georgetown. I go live in Florence, often, often because I'd been speaking for so long, often, especially in southern Italy, mistaken as Italian. <laughs> So, so here I come out here in the 80s, not too long after that, enter into analysis, and Ray is like, uh, you know, I think there's sort of a background here going on. So I'm like, okay. And so I contact the adoption agency, Lutheran Social Services in Jersey City. Lutheran Social Services in Jersey City, the social worker who was responsible for my adoption is still working there 27 years later which is a little bit synchronistic, but you know, it's not that crazy. I mean, I've been in practice now for what, 35 years in Berkeley, and I'm actually seeing 
the grandchildren of some of my original clients. So it's not too hard if you've been in one place for a long time. So 27 years later, you know, she's still there. And she's like, well, I can't give you any identifying information, but I can release the, un the non-identifying information about your background. Sure enough, I'm Italian. Mom's Italian, father's Scotch-Irish. There's not much else there. So my late husband and I used to go to Italy about every other year. I'd lived there, I'd gone to school there. He loved Italy, who doesn't like Italy? It's a great place to vacation. So we would go every other year. And of course, now that I know I'm Italian, it starts to work on me. And in Italy, you know, like, I mean, they understand themselves as Italian, but their primary identification is where they're from. You know, they're Florentine, they're Sienese, they're Napolitano. You know, they're, they're where they're from. So Italian is kind of like too broad. I'm like, I need to know where the family's actually from. So I call back, this is now two years later, we're planning a trip to go there. I call back Lutheran Social Services and like, okay, I want to actually know this information. And they're like, well, we don't have that on file. The social worker that I've been talking to had since retired. And now we have this kind of uptight Lutheran pastor who's run on this deal. And I'm already a marriage and family therapist, right? So it's a little bit of male knocking heads here. But so he's like, well, we don't have that information. I don't know how we could get it. And I'm like, well, we're going to contact my birth mother. <laughs> That's how we're going to get it. Well, we would need to institute a search. I'm like, mm, yeah, you're an adoption agency. Institute the search. Uh, well, that will cost $300. I'm like, OK, I, I mean, I didn't sign this contract, but I'll pay $300 to get my own history. Sure. Um, so I send them the check. We'll institute the search. I don't hear for months. Now, you know, this is way before Ancestry.com and all of that. So I'm like, all right, I give them a little time. But we're going to Italy. I want to know where my family's from. I want to go visit, right? So I call back. In the interim, I have this dream. And the dream is super simple. I mean, many of you have encountered this, in which the simplest dreams often are kind of the most impactful, right? The dream is simply, my mother's name is Gloria. So Gloria Hopke is my mother. So even my analyst is like, well, that's your mother's name. I'm like, OK, but that's kind of, you know, that was the dream. My mother's name is Gloria. I'm like, well, yeah, your mother's name is Gloria. So I get on the phone with, you know, Pastor Schmutz, whatever his name was. And I'm like, why? I haven't heard from you. We're going to Italy. What's going on with the search? Oh, we haven't been able to find anything. I'm like, yeah. OK. Um, so I said, well, why don't you give me at least the information you've got? And I'll start searching. Oh, well, we can't do that. And I just was like, you know, at that point, I was just like totally pissed off. Like, I'm paying $300 for my own background. <laughs> I have to like get through this bureaucracy and you know my Italian soul started getting fired up. So I you know I just said to him God wants me to have this information. <laughs> I have a degree in theology. I went to seminary. God wants me to have this information. He's like how do you know? I said because God sent me her name in a dream. And he's like, oh, yeah? And I said, yeah, get the file out. And you open that file. And I said, if I can tell you her name, I'm telling you, God wants me to have that information. So he said, OK, what's your name? I said, her name is Gloria. And he screamed. And he, <laughs> and he picked up the phone. And he said, oh, my god, her name is Gloria. Both my mothers are named Gloria. Both of them. <laughs> no. So he gave me her name. I go to the Berkeley Public Library. I look up the last, it's an unusual last name. My birth, uh, my birth mother's original maiden name is Abatiello. It's not a very common Italian name. And she ended up being the second youngest of 14. So there's like an entire phone book of Abatiello's in Bergen County and Essex County in New Jersey. So like there's that. And I, the first person I call is my uncle Albie. And I'm talking to my mother the next day. I'm like, boom, 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 you know, on the basis of a dream, really, on the basis of this like weird synchronistic dream, you know, that happened to, <laughs> happened to use, you know, to beat this guy over the head to give me the information I needed. But yeah, I was talking to her the next day, you know, and I now have know her. I've known her for the last 30 years. I've known my aunts and uncles. I know where the town, 
grandparents, my grandparents emigrated over here as kids with my, what were my great grandparents. My great grandparents actually emigrated and my grandparents met each other here in the United States. But the two towns that they're from in Italy, I'd been to a couple of times. I found my grandmother's birth record in the town hall. Because you know, in Italy, you walk in and 1896 is like yesterday for them. They're like, oh, how's your grandmother? I'm like, well, <laughs> she emigrated 120 years ago. <laughs> you know. <coughs> so that's an example sort of a dream synchronicity. I've had many of those throughout the course of my life, personally. A particularly touching one that I tell about my, uh, my client work was uh, in the... In the 80s, like many of us, we, I ran an AIDS prevention program in San Francisco, and I had a client <coughs> with HIV who came in. He originally came in uh, not due to anything really directly about his HIV, but his father was dying, and he wanted support through his father's death. <coughs> someone's got me. Yeah, someone's got me water. That's great. So um, we did our work. His father passed away went through the grieving mourning process. I would say, <coughs> I would say we uh, maybe worked together about two years. It was a really good relationship. We brought it to a conclusion. And I would say about hmm, nine months after I terminated with him, I had this really powerful dream of him. And which I, the dream, I just saw him in a hotel room near an ocean. And the, the atmosphere of the dream was really heavy and oppressive. And there was something wrong. And I um, woke up, and I thought seriously about calling him. Like one of those things where you're just like, OK, thank you so much. This is just what I need here. Thanks. Oh. Put it back here. <coughs> so you know, at the time, I was like, you know, you don't want to seem crazier than your clients. Like, oh my God, what's wrong? I kind of dream about it. You know, I couldn't quite figure out how I was going to contact him out of nowhere on the basis of a dream, right? Oh, I didn't do it. So I would say maybe about three or four months after that, he came in. He actually called me. And I'm just like, <coughs> we all have that experience, as I think, you know, in which the preparatory or prophetic quality of our dreams, right? So, you know, that, you know, when you're a therapist, you know, you're working with that. So I was like, okay, I was kind of more prepared to see him than I might have otherwise been. So I, read, I had written, of course, I keep a dream journal. So I, I wrote the dream down in my dream journal, which I generally carry with me. And he comes in, <clears throat> and especially this time, I had my dream journal with me. He comes in and he says, well, the reason I'm coming in now is for me, because my HIV is progressing. And um, I tried to commit suicide. You know, at the time, they called it self-deliverance back then. And it was very supportive. You know, there was an entire community of medical support around that back when, which he tapped into in San Francisco. So, you know, he got instructed by whomever on how to do this, which cocktail of drugs to take. And so he, he checked and he wanted to die by the ocean. So he went down to Pacifica. He got a hotel room in Pacifica. He took his drugs. He put the plastic bag over his head and went to sleep. Woke up two days later, having torn the bag off his head, you know, kind of unconsciously, thrown up all the drugs, you know, completely wrecked physically, but alive. At which point he said to me, well, I woke up and figured, OK, if I'm alive, I guess I was meant to live. Cleaned everything up, went home, called me. <laughs> He's like, OK, I need to process what's going on with me. <clears throat> so that's what I said, well, let me share my dream with you. <laughs> and it turned out I had that dream the night that that happened in Pacifica. So I'm sitting here with my dream journal. I pull it out. I'm like, let me read this dream to you. And I said, here's the date. And he's like, wow. I said, yeah, wow. That's pretty crazy. Because we had not seen each other in nine months. And out of nowhere. And I just said to him, well, what I make of that is <laughs> you may feel really alone, but we really don't have any awareness of how connected we are with other people through the unconscious. I didn't know that. You didn't know that. 
So I said, your conclusion, that is to basically not terminate your life, I think was obviously the right one because you didn't. But I have to say, I'm over here in Berkeley with no contact with you, being really concerned about your welfare. And I said, here it is in black and white in the dream journal. You know, it was one of those incidents in which, again, when you're talking about like, there is no explanation for it except the psychological explanation for it, you know? That's why the eight causality of it is something I'm constantly um, emphasizing. In a way, what caused it isn't as interesting as what he and I did with it. And I think that's the point of Jung's concept of synchronicity. So when we hit, we're hit with this, of course, it feels so much bigger than who we are. You know, like, I didn't ask, I didn't solicit this dream. And he certainly didn't send it to me. I'm like the last person he's probably thinking about at the time. And yet, that's what occurs. You know, that's what occurs. Some of the family stories, like my own family story about my birth mother, really knocked me over the head at times. <clears throat> One entire category of story that gave, gave rise to the book <clears throat> were um, particular, I mean, very detailed and specific aspects of someone's life that they had in common with relatives they never knew and never met, or some ancestors. So um, I had a client uh, at, at Unitas, actually, the original place that I worked for nine years. Um, who was a musician, and she was a double bassoonist. And it was sort of, it's, you know, being a bassoonist is already a little bit not uncommon. And not only that, but she sort of specialized in being a double bassoonist and a woman, right, in a pretty male world of professional musicians. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, she came from a very uh, scientific an education-oriented family. So being a musician was sort of looked at askance by her, particularly by her father. Her father was very sort of rational and science-oriented, and here she's going into music. He was very unsupportive, she said to me. So <clears throat> in the course of our work, what occurred was his father, her grandfather, died in Ohio. And they had been, his father was estranged from his father, for years, so she didn't really know very much about her grandfather. They just didn't have much to do. Anyway, grandfather dies in Ohio, so her, her sister, and her father all truck out to Ohio, go through the house, clean it up, get it on the market, et cetera. They arrive in the house, and you know, this is her father's family home. It's very richly resonant and very emotional. It's like a very charged atmosphere, right? Father's having to go back and confront his past. She's actually, sort of excited, you know, she's sort of excited to get in touch with kind of her background that she had been sort of blocked from due to her father's issues. So <clears throat> she goes up into the attic, she's, she's like, I'm gonna start at the top, we'll start clearing out the attic, starts clearing out the attic. She comes across a double bassoon in a case with this guy's name on it, an entire trunk of double bassoon music. I didn't even know there was a double bassoon literature, she said. <laughs> You know, there it is. <clears throat> and it turns out that whoever this was, who this belonged to, um, and it, it looked like he was sort of um, not just a double bassoonist, but an instructor or a teacher. Like he was really involved with it. So she brings this thing down to her father. And she's like, who is this? And he's like, I don't recognize the name, but the name sort of, the name sort of, he thinks that the name belonged to some cousin or uncle of his great uncle of his father's. He didn't, couldn't quite figure it out, but she was like, they're sitting there, and of course, here's this unsupportive father, here's this professional double bassoonist, and she comes across the way in which, from his family background, out of nowhere, there is this instrument that has run in the family for many years. And so she said, it was a little bit like, <clears throat> My father wasn't a very emotional or verbal or articulate person, but he was, she was like, we understood what this meant. <laughs> and she said, from that juncture on, <clears throat> I didn't hear much about my music career. He was actually pretty accepting and supportive of it. You know, the, the way in which this uncovering of this particular kind of commonality she had with an ancestor. Um, synchronistically in this event, sort of comes to the fore and sort of shifts <clears throat> the relationship she had with her dad. 
I like a little. I like those stories a little bit more, you know, because we always think like to tell these dramatic, synchronistic stories. But the ways in which these sort of subtle shifts that occur internally and emotionally for people on the basis of symbols or coincidences like this are a little bit more interesting to me, because I think they're a little bit more relatable. I mean, you know, we don't have. You know, we generally are not finding the loves of our lives on mountaintops and all of this like, kind of dramatic stuff. Some people do, but I think that's sort of a lovely sort of subtle way in which this family <clears throat> aspect comes forward. Another typical kind of class of story is commonalities between siblings. Wonderful story of a friend of mine. And again, another example of how synchronicity occurs for one person and not for another. She's the oldest sister. She's had this incredible psychic connection to her younger sister for her whole life. Um, she had dozens of stories. I couldn't have included them. She should write her own book, actually. Dozens of stories about the ways since, since her younger sister was born, psychic connections. Her younger sister was, she was five and the younger sister was two. And the sister was in preschool or somewhere and injured herself. And she went to her mother and said, you know, Annie is sick. And the mother's like, what? And then the phone call comes in. I'm sure Annie's been injured at school. And so this went on and on and on. Annie, her younger sister, um, didn't have a similar connection with her. But my, you know, my friend has this psychic connection with her younger sister. Uh, another one that I have, another friend of mine, <laughs> told me the story for the book, in which <laughs> he's a sort of hippy-dippy Berkeley older, uh, older brother who is just not, sort of not employed and kind of free-spirited. And my, and my friend is you know, married with kids. He's got a very organized life, et cetera. And this you know, older brother keeps intervening at times. And so what will happen is they're in a huge rush to get out. He's ready to go to work, et cetera. And the older brother will come with some distracting phone call about some emergency. And he's like, that's it. And he, he says, I'm just so tired of Ted making me late to work. <clears throat> and his wife eventually pointed out, that what occurred consistently was Ted would call, and because my client was, uh, my client, my friend was late, he would avoid a huge traffic backup somewhere in the Bay Area. And so well, his wife eventually, after the third time, said, but remember the last time Ted called? There was that huge thing that went on on the Bay Bridge, and because he called, you decided to go around Marin, and you missed the whole thing? And that happened three times in a row. And she said, I don't think Ted's doing that on purpose. So I think that's sort of a coincidence. And so he's sort of having a little bit more, like again, a shift in his relationship on the basis of these somewhat subtle coincidences that are occurring, these synchronistic events that occur within people's everyday lives. So um, another aspect, and this is what Shirley and I are talking about, another aspect of it that came through the four around families was the transition that we make when a family member dies. So I might actually, the third book on this series might be Synchronicity and Death, because people have all kinds of really interesting stories around death. Um, and I guess I'll close today by talking about mine. I was talking about my husband who uh, passed away from Alzheimer's in 2013. <clears throat> Itself was a super, super interesting process. Um, very difficult, but also as a clinician, kind of very interesting. We were talking about some of that at lunch. Uh, but in the last weeks of his life, a various electrical phenomena began to occur to me. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. So <clears throat> I'd, be sitting, I'd be sitting at home, and the doorbell would ring, and no one would be there. And, and um, I, would, I would go to the door, and I'd open it, and no one's there. And I'm like, how is this doorbell ringing? I don't get this, right? It happened probably about a dozen times. One of those wacky things I didn't say to anyone. Finally, I tell my sister. She's like, well, that's kind of weird. I'm like, yeah, I don't know who's coming to visit, but there's no one there. So um, he's in the nursing home at the Elmwood in Berkeley. One night I come back, you know, it's a very stressful time. Uh, you know, he's in the latter months of his, latter weeks of his life, really. I sit down in my living room, I'm exhausted, and suddenly all the lights in the house go on at once. Like every light in the house goes on. I'm like, oh, this is so creepy. <laughs> I immediately call my sister. I'm like, wah, 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 you know, and she's like, oh my God, maybe he died. So I go running to the Elmwood thinking like he's passed away. 
he hasn't passed away. He's sleeping in his thing. But I'm like, how did every light in the house go on? So the lights go on in the house, and I'm like, so the light is on, but the switch is off. I'm like, this is not good. <laughs> so I have to flip the switch on and then flip it off to turn this light, my bedroom light off. So I'm sleeping one night <clears throat> in my bed, and suddenly there's a light shining in my eyes, and I don't know what this light is from. I track it down, I get up, so I have a sort of a standing lamp in my living room that somehow turned itself on at two o'clock in the morning. And it's shining in on my white bathroom curtain, which is then reflecting into my eyes in bed. I'm like, oh my God, this is so weird. I'd be sitting there, the TV would turn on, um, CD player would turn on. Suddenly I'm sitting there one day, I'm hearing disco music come from the front room. I'm like, what is this? This is like, the haunted house, right? Disco music. Well, in a CD-ROM of an old computer that was still on, I had put some old disco thing, I don't know why, maybe to rip the music off the CD, you know? And like suddenly there's disco music coming out of my office. I'm like, this is so strange. So I'm sitting outside the Elmwood. It was a really difficult night there. Sitting in my car, my car keys are in my hand, all the lights on the car go on, including the headlights, for about three seconds and go off. I'm like, the keys are in my hand. This is so weird. So my sister, I don't know what anyone thought. I was telling my sister about it, a couple other people. I thought my sister thought maybe they were, I was like making this stuff up. So she came out that Christmas and she's sitting there and we're in my living room and suddenly there's Gregorian chant coming out of the bedroom. And I have like a clock radio CD, and I have this wonderful Gregorian chant thing that I wake up to every day. And at six o'clock in the evening, the thing went on. And she's like, oh my God, you're telling the truth. I'm like, yeah, shit's going on and off here all the time. And, she's, and she was the one that came up to this. She was, I was saying this at lunch. Um, we bought this house. It was like really a teardown. And Paul and I remodeled it all. And he loved doing the electrical work on this house. <laughs> He installed all of these outlets, all of these switches, you know, and he was one of these like early adopters of all this technology. So there was all this new wireless technology. So, you know, you couldn't just, in my house, you can't just go and turn the light on. You have to go find the controller, you have to find the number, you have to put, it's a huge pain. I got it all ripped out after he died. I was like, that's it, I'm on a normal light switch. But that's what happened. I mean, he had installed all of the stuff and she said, well, he is just, and a complete control queen, like really a control person who loved to have control over everything. Oh, I can sit in the living room and turn this on and I can sit in the bedroom and turn that on. And we had speakers everywhere. And that's what she said. She's like, well, if he was gonna manifest himself in any way, shape or form, it was, it's gonna be through this electrical equipment. I'm like, you are absolutely right. You know, he spent the last five years of his life, his working life uh, as a computer consultant so computer-related stuff was all there. She's like, you know, it's sort of interesting. It's like, it's not like gardening things that are occurring or, you know, it's not home maintenance. It's specifically all this electrical stuff. He was still alive. He had not died. But it continued after he died. <laughs> and so I, was, so I was sitting there talking to my spiritual director about this, uh, active practicing Roman Catholic. I was Dominican spiritual director the last 20 years. And he died, he was cremated, and I had his ashes in a, a lovely sort of wooden urn, I'll say, in my front room. And Chris was like, yeah, we don't generally keep human remains in a home in the Catholic tradition. We usually put them in a cemetery. And I was like, yeah, I think it's time to move Paul on. <laughs> so that's what happened. Um, in 2014, Valentine's Day, put him to rest in a particular niche in St. Mary's uh, Cemetery here in Oakland. And since then, no electrical things have occurred. He is now finally, God bless his heart, at rest. Now, how do you explain that? You can't explain that. The point is, these are very, I'll say, definitely odd electrical experiences. They're all occurring within a time of transition. They're occurring at a time of emotional richness. 
They're highly symbolic, given who he was, right? And, the, and there's no explanation for them. You know, I mean, if you look at them, you have to say these are coincidences. This is just a coincidence that my electrical work and my computers are misfunctioning or misfiring, you know, at a specific time. But, you know, it's hard not to go to the causal explanation. It's hard not to say, you know, he's fucking with me. Like, you know, he's like leaving this life. His spiritual energy is like invading my house. And when I finally get him at rest at St. Mary's Cemetery, <laughs> finally leaves me alone and leaves all the electrical equipment alone. But there's another example of a synchronistic event. So sometimes synchronistic events are these like singular dramatic incidents. And sometimes there are a long series of different things that occur over time, the meaning of which you don't know until much later. You know, and that's one of those things that I call them revelatory synchronicities, you know, that the meaning of them is slowly revealed over time, you know. So it was an interesting set of coincidences around his death, you know. Um, a story that I tell that I actually end the first book with is a lovely story, too. And this was a client of mine. <clears throat> she had come into therapy because her son had been uh, killed in a car accident. So. They had a wonderful Christmas. <clears throat> she was living in the Berkeley, Oakland area. She had, they had a wonderful Christmas together, but he was going to school up in uh, Davis. And he was killed in a car accident on 80. And, uh, you know, you don't really get over anything like that. You just sort of cope with it. So she came into therapy with me around that specific incident. Um, but she came in with this story, and that was that... Um, <clears throat> After he, Todd was killed, uh, <clears throat> she was sitting there, and she had a really hard time for the first year, you know, like most, most clients, I'll say. I say this to my interns sometimes. Most clients don't come until they absolutely have to, you know. Uh, so that's what happened. Like, she was really in a very severe depression. She should have come in much earlier. But she sat around, and she was telling me, like, the first year, she was just, like, numb. Like, she really couldn't really handle any of it. And she was in a deep depression. She was going through all of his belongings, all of the pictures, and she was sitting there one day. And suddenly the postman rings, the mailman rings, and the mailman said, I didn't really want to put this in a box, in the box, because it's so beat up. But here's an envelope, and it's an it's an actual, so she says, envelope that I see my son's handwriting and his return address in Davis. And this is months, six months after he's dead. And she's like, where is this coming from? So what happened was, it's this wonderful letter with pictures that somehow he got developed of their last Christmas vacation together at one of these one hour photo places that he stopped by on the way back to school, wrote his mother and father a letter, included the pictures, said this is a wonderful, you know, wonderful, wonderful vacation. Thank you so much. You know, I really appreciate it. And you know, here onward and upward, right? What happened was <clears throat> he didn't put sufficient postage on it. So it got tossed back to the dorm. The dorm where he was living, of course, he's dead. He's not there any longer. They didn't know what to do with it. It kicked around UC Davis mail service for a while. Finally, some responsible person realized, oh, that's who this is. This is Todd, who died in the car accident. This is to his parents. So somebody finally put enough postage on it and got it sent to her six months later. So here at this nadir, I'll say, of her depression, this letter arrives from her son six months later, the timing of which was just perfect. And she was like, it was a turning point in her work, you know, with me. Uh, when she was telling me this, she was like, <clears throat> it realized that he's gone and he's not gone. He's here and he's not here. The synchronistic event sort of shows that while he's not here physically, he's still here with me psychically and in a way, literally, you know, like there are still parts of him that are here in the world, even if he isn't. And so it was one of those kind of wild coincidences, again, where something ostensibly went, quote unquote, wrong. You know, the letter didn't get to her, but the timing of it was so psychologically perfect and powerful that it ended up being synchronistic. So our capacity to make meaning is really what's behind it. I mean, we can point to this cause or that cause, you know, the power failure or the 
screwy post office or whatever, um, you know, <laughs> malfunctioning of my computer equipment. Those are the causes, but that's not what makes it synchronistic. What makes it synchronistic is what we make of it. So sometimes people will say to me, like in these talks, not you folks, but you know, normal like book talks, they're like, well, you're just making that up. You know, you're just reading meaning into something. I'm like, what's the problem with that? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Like, and that's Jung's point. Like the point Jung had was that when we look at the random events of our life and we get in contact with our deeper self and we create for ourselves a coherent narrative based on who we actually are, then the random events of our life become meaningful. So that's why I'm like, okay, like, should I walk around feeling meaningless? Would that be better? You know, like, you're just reading meaning into that. And I'm like, well, or just making it up. And I'm like, well, okay, like, this book is not a natural phenomenon. This did not precipitate out of the sky. I made it up. I wrote it, I created it. Like the best aspects of human culture are made up. That's what we do, like homo faber, we make things, right? So that's why I was like, Jung's point in, in the synchronistic, in the, in the concept of synchronicity was to empower us to do that. And it's a really powerful way of saying that our meaning, the meaning that we make of our lives <coughs> is key to our individuation process. Of course we make it up. That's the point of it, right? Why did these occur in families? Well, I thought to myself, that is interesting, why families? And I thought to myself, well, isn't the family in a certain way a symbol of the self? You know, like the family in a family represents a certain kind of wholeness. You know, it's got, there's no beginning and no end. It's kind of this eternity, and yet we're related to one another. It felt to me that uh, one of the things that we hear frequently, kind of particularly in this culture, is a very sort of literal and biological understanding of family. You know, families are blood relationships. But in working as a marriage and family therapist for all these years, and especially as a gay man, a male gay man, you know, family is a fairly well, not just a family, family is a psychological concept. And that's what I thought to myself, like, our families in a way represent to us, often largely unconsciously, a basic sense of who we are and our wholeness in the world. So it makes complete sense to me that the archetype of the self would act through our family relationships and manifest itself in various synchronistic events, whether it's my birth mother's name, or whether it's the death of a son, or whether it's my husband's passing. You know, our family relationships would be the locus of a lot of synchronistic meaning in our lives. That the family is not just a biological, literal relationship we have to one another, but it's actually a psychic concept, uh, sort of a field in which we live that we're not always aware of. <clears throat> you know, that's where it's part of our, it's you know, kind of a specific example of what I might call the collective unconscious. It's sort of a little collective conscious, you know, of our family. So <coughs> that's Jung's concept. That's Jung's intention. That's the way in which I think it, this concept is really valuable. I think it's a valuable concept. It's not just sort of an interesting, curious, delightful sort of thing to read about. You know, it's really kind of at the center of the individuation process if we let it. And I just think it's, uh, you know, that's why I've written the books, you know, sort of empower people to make sense of the random events that are, their lives and sort of if something occurs and it isn't quite yet clear what it means, just hold it there, you know, let it ripen. We'll see what happens. You know, subsequent events may occur, which then illuminate what it means to you. So thanks so much for having me. Wow. Thank you. Do people want to ask questions? Oh, that would be good too. Just don't ask me what whales mean. Or... <laughs> it's nice to be with a little bit more Jungian, sophisticated Jungian group than usual. So. Yeah, you know, um, the anniversary of, 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 of uh, Woods, Woodstock, Stonewall, is a, this weekend. Yeah. And, um, and it occurred to me that, um, you know, it's related to Judy Garland's death, 
And, I, and then it occurred to me, knowing that you were going to speak, whether you would think of Judy Garland's death and then that as a synchronous event, because it may not have happened if they had been. If, that had, if, if he hadn't happened and the grief generated by it, um, and that group of people. Well, you know what's interesting about that? All right, so. So uh, one of the things that uh, what Carol is saying is that uh, the Stonewall riot back in 1969 is said to have occurred at the night of Julie, Judy Garland died. Well, the Stonewall riots occurred over a couple of days, actually. One of those days she had died. But what I think is interesting about that is whether or not you know, the date is precise or it isn't precise, what you're sort of seeing is the symbolic quality of her death and the symbolic quality of the Stonewall. So it's one of those things where it's synchronistic if you tell me it is. <laughs> right? I'm not going to say, oh, no, that's not synchronistic. You know, um, it's synchronistic because it's meaningful. You know, there's a particular kind of passing of the old world and the beginning of a new world that that date, we're memorializing it now even you know, what, 50 years later, right? It's 50 years? My math right? Yeah. Yeah, we're memorializing it even 50 years later. And of course, if you want to read, in Young Jungians and Homosexuality, my book, uh, I do an entire chapter on the Wizard of Oz as a gay myth. You know, gay men have such a relationship to it. So in that book, the original book in 1989, so I looked at everything Jung said about homosexuality. I looked at what subsequent Jungians had said about it. It was kind of critical. So. But that's cool, you know. And then um, I looked at the archetype of the feminine, the archetype of the masculine, and the archetype of the androgyne as refracted through gay men's experience. Partly because back then, homosexuality was, a, was talked about as an identification with the feminine. And I'm like, that's not my experience as a gay man. <laughs> I mean, I'm a great relationship to the feminine, but you know, I'm having sex with a man. There's a lot of masculinity going on here that I think these people are missing. So I picked a couple of gay porn stories and subjected them to a Jungian and symbolic lens, which is kind of interesting. Didn't make me very popular, but, <laughs> but around the feminine, the Wizard of Oz just felt to me so rich, like gay men identify with that story. Uh, you know, there's like a sing-along Wizard of Oz at the Castro Theater, and you know, there at least was all the time. When Dianne Feinstein was running for mayor once, once upon a time, way back when, you know, Sister Boom Boom, the, the remember, she had that campaign poster that had the Wicked Witch of the West saying, surrender, Diane. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like just part of the iconography of the gay community. So I was like, well, there has to be something going on with that symbolically. So I look at that. I looked at the way in which, you know, the archetype of the feminine for gay men, you know, you identify with Dorothy. And what does the wizard mean? And what does the cowardly lion, you know, represent? And what does the witch represent, et cetera? So I think she's a very important person. You know, she's a very important person. A lot of strong female figures are very important for the gay community. And so I don't think it's just, it is random chance. Stonewall occurred, you know, on one of the nights she died. But what's been made of it is synchronistic. You know, what's been made of it is exactly the point of what I've been saying. You know, it's very meaningful. And that's what I would say. Like, what does that symbolize? Well, you know, she definitely represents a certain fragility, vulnerability, self-destructiveness. You know, she's, she was a very disturbed woman, you know, and yet extraordinarily talented. And I feel like, you know, what an interesting symbol to pick for the community, particularly the community at that time. You know, the drag queens and the broken folks that, you know, were both, you know, brilliant as well as persecuted and damaged. You know, and then to take your power, you know, to take your power and riot and sort of establish yourselves as a community, really the beginning of gay liberation, we're still celebrating it. So, yeah, that's just a really, that's a great example of sort of a community synchronicity, if you want to say it that way. Yeah, because those drag queens rioting in Stonewall, I don't think they even knew Judy Garland had died. You know, it's not like the internet. It wasn't like they were getting Twitter back in 1969, you know. So, but that is true. It just happened on one of the nights. I have a question. Sure. When did he write about synchronicity? When did Leon write about synchronicity? Earlier? 
1950. The book uh, Synchronicity of Any Causal Connecting Principle came out in 1950. And then when did he go to India? Mm. Someone else could probably answer that better than I. I'm presuming before that. Yeah. I can't imagine him running around India in his 80s, but he could have. He was Swiss. He was rather vigorous. But <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I think he went, I'm presuming he went earlier, but I guess we'll all have to read Memory Streams Reflections tonight. Or look it up online. Yeah, we can look it up online. You can look it up online while I'm talking. Yeah, I have a little bit of a problem with how you're presenting this. Okay. I like what, I, I mean, I love the stories, but without holding a spiritual connection to this, it feels like it's just, you're just taking, you're making it very secular, and it may or may not be, with, without considering that, um, you know, maybe God doesn't perhaps you, the universe doesn't mm -hmm. perhaps you with us. And if, if that theory is, the opposite, then there, I don't believe in coincidence. Well, I don't know if I would say it was the opposite. Well, it, when it, it sounded to me like he was throwing out any possibility of that there, these are not about coincidences, that synchronicity may or may not be choreography that en enables us to get free by giving us exactly what we need. That's why the guy next to us might not get Correct. Uh, you know, inspired the same way because that's not for them. Well, but that's actually consonant with how Jung related to religious or spiritual content. I mean, I have to say. So what I'm at, I'm not at all, dis uh, I have a degree in theology. I'm an active practicing Catholic. I have an experience of the divine daily. So far be it from me to kind of discount that. What I want to do here is represent accurately what Jung wrote. So Jung wrote this concept not as a spiritual concept, really very much strictly as a psychological con concept. And then his relationship, I mean, he had a very interesting relationship to spirituality and religion, you know, in which I would basically say uh, when he was wearing his psychiatrist hat, he was agnostic because he felt professionally he needed to be. He's like, I can write a psychology of religion, but I can't talk about those issues theologically. Those are for the theologians to talk about. I'm not going to talk about the object of reality of God. That's for philosophers and theologies. So he stayed on this side of the line when he was wearing his professional hat. I'm going to stay over here and look at how those experiences of the God image in the human psyche function. But you get him in front of the BBC interviewer, right? And the BBC interviewer says, do you believe in God? He says, I don't believe, I know. So that's what I'm saying. I feel like what I do, too, as a Jungian is exactly that same dance. When I'm wearing my professional psychological hat, or I'm representing what Jung actually wrote about synchronicity, strictly speaking, it is a psychological aspect. As I said earlier, too, what's clear is that the meaning that many of us experience in these events is spiritual, is divine, right? Jung would say, that's your prerogative. If that's how you experience it, that's your meaning, that's your belief. He's not going to deny it, right? What he's saying, however, in terms of how it functions psychologically, is that <clears throat> that's a causal explanation. When I say God, like I said in my story about my mother, right? If I and I kind of do, <laughs> like God told me her name. I mean, I was sort of being facetious with this guy to get my point across, but I, I have to say, you know, like God sends me dreams all the time about all kinds of things. That's my belief, I can't prove that. So Jung had to stay kind of on this side of the line when he was wearing his professional hat. And he did so pretty consistently in his public writings. But as we all know, that's actually not how he himself thought, lived, believed. You know, he just kept that out of his public writings. You know, when you read the Red Book or you read even some of the stuff that he wrote in some of the writings around synchronicity, you know, he was pretty, not, not just pretty open, I mean, he was more open than almost any other psychologist to the validity of spiritual and religious experience. I mean, be him and he and William James are responsible for even the field of psychology of religion. 
you know, if it wasn't for Jung. So, yeah, that's what I mean. So, you know, I hope you don't misunderstand. I'm really trying to just simply represent accurately what he wrote, not make a case for it. He himself didn't even believe that it was simply that. You know, he believed much more like what... I would love for you to also include that, because what it sounds like to me, when you're doing the way you're doing it, is that you that there's a negation. You know what I always say to people when they say that? Write your own book. <laughs> that's the book you need to write. <laughs> Good. That's what I, I always say that to people. But when people yeah. say, you know, you should have done. I'm like, well, write that book. I want to read your book. I want to read your uh, book. I just, I just think when it comes out, it comes out a little more. Well, I, would, I maybe direct you to the chapter that I wrote in uh, the first book, There Are No Accidents. Because the chapter on spirituality and religion is much more sophisticated than what I'm able to actually kind of put across here today in a talk. You know, what we're, for, like, for example, one of the topics that I deal with in the first book was miracles, right? Miraculous healings. Are they synchronistic? Are they God's action? Dreams, spiritual dreams. You know, I look at some of the dreams that you know, sort of per portrayed in sort of the Jewish scripture, uh, Christian scripture. Are those psychological? Are they sent by the divine? You know, within the cultural context of Judaism or Christianity, it's kind of clear where they came from. You know, they didn't come from the archetype of the self. <laughs> God disclosed to, to Joseph in a dream what was going to be happening to the nation of Egypt, you know, and it actually moved him forward, or God disclosed in the dream how to get out of prison to St. Paul. Like, so in other words, you know, within those contexts, you can, I think what I, what I would say instead is that it's not either or, it's both. Like, I think it's interesting to sort of look at what someone makes of it, or I wouldn't even say makes of it, really what they, the spiritual quality of their experience of those events, and look at it psychologically too. I think having both of those perspectives uh, enriches how we could look at it. But you know, I'm, I'm, I actually, to tell you the truth, Jung wrote about these things from a strictly psychological perspective, frankly, because he was afraid that his ideas would be discounted within a field of psychology that had no room for any spirituality or religion. He was already seen somewhat as a crackpot because of his openness to any number of different kinds of things. And so that's a lot of times I will say you're correct. I think he very compensatorily drew a very bright line between those two things, when in fact there isn't that much of a bright line. He was afraid of having his ideas discounted as mysticism, Gnosticism, and it was. So I think that's why, you know, I think that's why he did what he did. We could have an entire night on synchronistic spiritual events, because God knows. I mean, you know, I have, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm around. I could come back. That's Walnut Creek. I'm yeah, <laughs> that's Walnut Creek. <laughs> it's more like Grass Valley, I think. Okay. So, Adam. Well, I, I wanted to um, ask about the people that you mentioned that say, oh, you're just making this up, or that really want to stamp out the idea that coincidences could have meaning, that there could be meaning inherent some way in, in life. Uh, I mean, I always experience that as kind of soul killing. What, but I'm trying to have a little empathy for those people. Why do you think they're so negative towards the idea that there's meaning? I think it's kind of, I, mean, I think it's kind of overwhelming. That's what I would say as a clinician. That's what I would say. You're, you're nodding in the back too. I mean, um, when we encounter the self with a capital S, it's pretty scary. It's pretty awesome. You know, I mean, we were just talking about spirituality and religion, so I'm sort of on my mind. You know, like when, when God speaks to somebody in the scripture, it's scary. You know, like when you're dealing with the infinite wholeness of the entire universe and you have to encounter it individually terrifying. It's mostly terrifying. And in fact, you know, that's why <laughs> kind of in typical Jungian analysis, you know, people read all these wonderful things about archetypes and they just want to dive into the archetypal level. And, you know, and you can't 
do that. Like, that's too much. And I think, so what happens is I think people get unconsciously scared, you know, or you or I, when we come, you know, sort of full of a, 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 a feelable numinosity around an event, it scares people, you know. And it also, I think, maybe, let's just say, when any, someone wants to spoil someone else's pleasure, you're usually dealing with envy, too. You know, they sense an emptiness in their lives, and they see you or me vibrating with, you know, meaning, and they're like, yeah, I'm going to shit on that. I don't like that. He has something I'm don't have, and I don't like them, you know? So I think that's also a piece of it, but I think it's more the terror. I mean, that's mostly what I get on a feeling level. Like, wow, that's scary. Like, what if God is actually talking to me? Like, oh my, me, you know? Well, that's true. That's absolutely true, but you could spend years in therapy trying to do that, right? <laughs> I have, I can tell you from personal experience, you know, that's my spiritual director actually says that to me all the time. If you took off the parent projection, you'd have a better relationship with Jesus. I'm like, well, okay, I'm working on it. I'm 16. Yeah, can you discuss the role of inspiration and synchronicity specifically as related to, you know, you have a synchronistic degree where you get the name of your birth mother. But to enact it, you have to be inspired to say, God wants me to have that information. And that becomes the transformational tool that if he had been a different person, it might have affected him differently. But yet it shifted him to say, oh, give me the name. Okay, you're in. Right. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you what you mean by inspiration. I guess I would, you know, we could use the Jungian term intuition. I mean, really... You know, the more you use your unconscious, the more skillful you get at it. <laughs> the more it becomes a little bit of an art. You know exactly when to push and how to push and how to manipulate and how to, talk, especially as a therapist, right? I mean, that's what we're doing all the time. We're trying to suss out people's unconscious if we're trying to do it for their own benefit. You know, I'm not trying to like, exert, exert power over somebody. But, you know, I have to kind of wiggle them around this resistance and wiggle them around that resistance and sort of sort of plant that seed and then water it a little and then plant wait and you know. So that's what I would say. I mean, um, you also, I think, uh, need, one needs to be somewhat fearless at times. You know, I mean, if you're gonna go up against a collective, you gotta have a, your courage in place, you know, cause you're not gonna be thanked for individuating. <laughs> you know, everyone wants you to fall in line. So you have to be a little sfacciato, as they say in Italian, you know, sort of a little bit sort of bald faced about it. And there are some people that are actually, I mean, you know, more endowed with that particular quality than those of us that grew up Italian on the East Coast, maybe a little bit more here in California, we can run people over a bit, but um, that's what I would say, inspiration, you know, you're correct, I mean, I think, I'm constantly working with my own clients, some of my friends, like, okay, what's your gut say? Let's check in with your intuition. Like, what would you just, just here in the safety of the room, just tell me what you'd say, you know? And then when you, someone can hear it or someone can feel themselves saying it, it's more likely that they're gonna come from a more integrated place rather than stuffing it down or defending or trying to be polite or, trying to be what their mother or their father told them to be or, you know, whatever, you know, like that's what we're trying to do. So, you know, that's what I said. That's why I ensconced it really kind of very much in the course of my career because I had already been married to a family therapist. You know, I was like, I was, I, I was happy to confront another professional that I didn't feel like was actually behaving very professionally. So, and I got my 300 bucks back. I absolutely did. I said, you didn't do any work on my behalf. I found my birth mother. What the hell? I don't mind paying for your staff work, but no, forget it. And they gave me my $300 back. I don't know why I should be paying for my own history anyway. Like, I didn't sign this contract. I didn't consent to be adopted. I mean, be one, one thing, you know, I, wait, I didn't sign that agreement. Why am I paying that money? So, anyway. Um, I guess what I was hearing from your talk is the value of revaluing our own subjectivity. And yes. As meaning makers, we're, yeah. we're creating meaning from the outside world as well as our interior world. Right. And that's the kind of thing that's being forgotten. Well, it's very much discouraged in modern culture and modern U.S. culture. I mean, some of it's typological. You know, there's the extroversion, the extroverted thinking quality of our culture, right? So one's interior life is constantly being discounted, devalued, you know, all the time. But you know, that's one of the reasons why, in a way, you're correct. You know, Jung is landing so hard, 
so often in all of his writings on the subjective quality of all of these things because he's having to make a case it, over against a culture that really doesn't prize it, doesn't support it, discounts it, wants to use it, you know, values the objective, values the empirical, values what you can see, what you can buy, what you can weigh, what you can measure. And, you know, the interior life, you know, man in search of a soul, right? That's the title of the book, right? There's a way in which the soul quality of our interior life was discounted even back in Jung's time, and now we're living in the times we're living in, you know, like, woo -hoo. So, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, that, that's why, I, in a way, I approach the synchronistic topic the way I do, you know, to make a case for valuing one's subjectivity. And, of course, that's what I do as a therapist. But I think that's why it's important what I do as a therapist, what we do in our own therapies, you know, is to kind of bring that forward. That's how, if there's going to be any resolution in any of these outside situations, it's going to come through the inside, I frankly think. I don't think it's going to come from the outside. It's going to come through creativity. It's going to come through uncovering what's unconscious. It's going to come through telling the truth. It's going to come through integrating the multiplicity and the diversity of what each of us is and what each of us is together. I mean, that's how it's all going to come together. So that's my belief. Uh, when, you're, when you're talking about this, it occurs to me that the subjectivity feels like you have to suffer subjectivity. And it, it reminds me of reading the I Ching and the many years ago beginning to have a relationship to it and wanting some definitive answer. Right. And after a long time of struggling with that, realizing that these are just sort of things to meditate on. Yeah. And it's really up to me to kind of suffer the not knowingness and what does it mean to me yeah. rather than getting some kind of clear answer. Yeah, I mean, I have tons to say on that, frankly. I mean, uh... So the first thing that comes to my mind is a saying of Jung's, which is every victory for the self is a defeat for the ego. So the suffering that we're talking about is not, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's not suffering. It's just ego, you know, having to give up, detach from our ego, our own like small ideas of it. Sometimes it's really suffering. Speaking from personal experience, sometimes it's really suffering. And that, I have to say, you know, I, I had, I have a degree in theology, and clients come, religious and spiritual clients come to me all the time, and they're like, why do people suffer? And I'm like, oh. sort of this unanswered question, particularly within Christian theology. I mean, there's various hypotheses, theologically speaking, but none of them are especially satisfying, and they all sort of end in, it's a mystery, which doesn't really help. So, <laughs> so I have to say, functionally speaking, as an actual practicing psychotherapist for 35 years and having lived as a human being for longer than that. The only explanation for suffering is what you're pointing at for me, which is that um, suffering is an instrument of consciousness raising. It raises our consciousness. It sometimes destroys us or breaks us. But I think if we have sufficient support it can actually result in transformation. Now, we have a particular symbol of that within the Christian tradition, the crucifixion, you know, which is the middle stage of an incredible, infinite transformation of consciousness, right? But that's, you know, every religious tradition has their own particular take on the meaning of suffering, but it all kind of boils down to <laughs> suffering as a modality for raising our consciousness. I have to remind myself of that when I'm suffering. Right. And, and when I use the word suffering, I meant suffering and, but more, just discomfort. You know, the sense that yeah, it's not going to be out there. The answer's not going to be out there. There's going to have to be some work, and right. sometimes it's really difficult. Sometimes it's just discomfort. Well, that's again why you know the analysts like using the word patient, which you know is derived from the word to suffer, passio to undergo or to suffer, and suffer not just suffer in the sense of pain, but suffer in the sense of what you're talking about, which is to kind of endure or hold a situation passively, patient passively, you know, in other words, to hold it. And that's what we do in our analysis. It's like we help our clients hold the experience until the meaning of it comes forward. Synchronistic events that we're talking about, of course, <clears throat> are, you know, a particular category and an example of that. 
you know, in which sometimes a whole series of random events just have to be suffered, so to speak, sort of endured until the ultimate meaning of it becomes kind of clear, right? And then the last thing I guess I'll say, because I'm, I'm going to be talking to the interns at Pacific Center tomorrow, where I'm a volunteer supervisor and been volunteering there for a long time. Uh, when the new cohort comes in, I talk to them about it. And, you know, the new interns come in, people who've never seen a client, right? So I'm there to talk to them about how they're there to learn. They're not there to do a job. They don't know how to do the job. That's why they're being trained, right? But they all come in and everyone, you know, there's narcissistic issues are way up and their competitiveness is way up and they all want to show how insightful and wonderful and healing and they're going to say the perfect insight. Because, you know, we all read these wonderful books of, you know, 20 years of an analysis distilled into a book. So, of course, you know, Gilda France looks like she's amazing because, you know, she saw the person for 20 years and she said this thing and it changed their life. And so, but that's not how it actually works. So I'm there to sort of like, calm on down, calm down, calm down. And I often talk about this uh, article, I think it was written by Hilda Brook, you know, way back when, about <laughs> mature non-knowing, beginning non-knowing versus mature non-knowing and doing psychotherapy, right? So sometimes when you start with a client, you just don't know. You, you, obviously, the person's a complete stranger. So the whole first phase of your work is tripping over various things and empathic disattunement, trying your best to sort of get to know a stranger. But then you eventually get familiar with the client, and you advance to a state of mature not knowing. And I always point out to the interns, there's never a knowing. There are only states of not knowing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say, that's the case. I've done this for 35 years. I may see the client for 20 years, you know, I have to say. But I don't know what's going to happen in the future. There's at least that piece of not knowing. None of us knows what's going to happen in the future. We're all going to be saddled with an unconscious for the rest of our lives. There's going to be some level of not knowing that goes on there. So there are only states of beginning not knowing versus mature not knowing. And I think, you know, part of the maturity is accepting and knowing that, so that when stuff isn't especially clear, we can just sit with it for a bit and let it percolate. I hate to cut it short. I only have it until the building until 3 o'clock, and then the dinner party's coming in. Great, so we'll stay. I want to thank you, Robert. <laughs> All right.